Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, we're going to be covering peds, and I'm going to be going over the hospitalized child. Specifically, I'm going to be going over post-operative care and skin care. Now, before we get uh, started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support this channel. Like this video, subscribe to this channel if you haven't done so already, and press the red notification bell so you'll be notified every time a new video is released. As I'm sure you're aware, I'm now offering NCLEX review sessions and one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions. Now, my goodness, I can't believe how fast you guys book those one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions. I promise I'm going to open more time on my calendar. I just have to make that time, but I promise it's coming. So if you see that my one-on-one -on -one tutoring session is booked as it is now, keep checking. I'm going to be opening more time. So just go to my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com, and you can see my availability not only for the one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions, but for the NCLEX review as well. Also, before we get started, guys, my son's uh, doing a soccer tournament. So I'm away. I'm in a hotel room. So if you hear noise in the background, that's my kids going in and out of the hotel room. I told them to stay away, but you guys know kids don't listen. So don't even worry about that. Just focus on this uh, information we're about to go over. Now, when it comes to post-operative care of uh, the patient and even skin care, lots of test questions come from this. So I'm going to go over the things that you need to know listen closely. This is important. So we're going to start with start with the post-operative care. Let me make this a little bit bigger for you. Okay. So over here, post-operative care, um, patients just had surgery. Before we even get started, any patient who's had surgery, whether we're talking about a pediatric patient or we're talking about adult, you need to always be concerned about these three things. You need to be concerned about hemorrhage. They just had surgery. This is an invasive procedure. You don't want them bleeding out. So you're going to be watching out for those signs and symptoms of hemorrhage, such as that blood pressure dropping, such as that heart rate and the respirations increasing, such as that H&H &H, um, going down, right? You're going to be watching out for that. You're going to be concerned about uh, DVT, them developing a clot, or even worse, that clot moving, turning into an emboli and going to the lungs, causing pulmonary edema. And your third concern always is going to be infection. You're going to be watching out for those signs and symptoms of infection. You know, elevated temperature, um, increased WBCs, redness, inflammation, warmth, all that good stuff. So whenever we talk about post-op care, in the back of your mind, I want you to think about those three concerns because many test questions are going to be based on those three. All right, let's get started. So post-operative care, you're going to want to obtain a baseline on your patient. You want to take the patient's vital signs, right? You want to make sure that blood pressure is not dropping. You want to make the, sure the pulse rate is within normal parameters. You're looking at that O2 sat. Preferably, we keep that O2 sat between 90 and 100, but we'll take 95. If it's 95 or higher, we're happy. Um, also, you're going to inspect the operative area. You want to make sure there's no redness, there's no inflammation, there's no warmth, there's no mucopurulent drainage, there's no foul odor, there's no bleeding. You're going to uh, check the dressing is present, reinforce, but do not remove loose dressing. This is very important. Why? Who removes that first dressing? The surgeon. All you can do as a nurse, you're going to reinforce it. And if you see excessive bleeding beyond the norm, you're going to um, place a phone call after you do your vital signs on the patient. You're going to make place a phone call, right? But you do not change the dressing. The first dressing change has to be changed by the surgeon. You're going to assess for compartment syndrome if any restrictive dressing. So let's say that patient has a cast. You better be checking for compartment syndrome. You better be checking um, the area distal to the injury or the fracture. You want to make sure that, you know, patient doesn't have any pain or that tingling sensation, which is a, a paresthesia. They don't have paralysis. Um, there's no coolness to that site, which tells you there's decreased circulation. Um, pain, pallor, paralysis, uh, paralysis poikothermogenesis, that's the coolness. I'm missing two Ps. Pain, pallor, paralysis. What are my other two? Hold on, guys. I'm going to look this up because I can't remember on top of my head. What are my other two Ps? Okay, pain, poico, thermogenesis, that's the coolness I talked to you about. Paresthesia, that's the tingling I told you about. Paralysis, I talked to you about that when they can't move. Oh, pulselessness. 
when you check distal, you check distal to the, the injury and they don't have a pulse. You're going to check for pulselessness and pallor. I told you pallor. What was the two I was missing? I said pain, poikothermogenesis, paresthesia, paralysis, pulselessness, pallor. Okay, well, those are the six Ps. That's what you're going to be looking out for anytime the patient has something restrictive, such as a cast. Um, you're going to assess the skin color and characteristics. You want the skin to be uh, pink. That's what lets you know there's circulation going on. You're going to assess the level of sedation and activity. By the way, um, I didn't mention this, but the one for compartment syndrome, those six Ps, that's been seen on NCLEX very, very often. So make sure you guys know that. Let's keep going. There we go. Um, you're going to check the dressings for bleeding and other abnormalities. You're going to check bowel sounds because remember the patient had surgery. They were probably on opioids. Um, we want to make sure that the bowel sounds have returned before they even get anything to eat. And Clex expects you to know that. You're going to assess for bladder distension. You're going to assess their bladder. You're going to make sure you're checking the INOs. You're going to observe for signs and symptoms of dehydration. With dehydration, you're going to see the urine output start to decrease. You're going to see that um, the H&H &H go up, okay? So you're going to be looking out for signs and symptoms of dehydration. You're going to look out for signs and symptoms of infection. You're going to take the vital signs every two hours. Take uh, specimens as ordered. Inspect the wound for signs of infection, such as redness, swelling, heat, pain, purulent discharge, or um, malodorous or foul smelling discharge. Now that's for the post-op patient. Let's move on to skincare. It's very important um, to make sure that we keep the patient's skin intact because remember, the skin is your first line of defense against infection. So if that skin is cracked, it's open, that is a perfect uh, entrance point for pathogens. You want to keep the skin free of excess moisture. Why? Things like um, um, urine, fecal matter, vomitus. Guess what? They're irritating to the skin. All diaper patients should have a barrier cream applied to keep that skin intact. We want to use minimum amount of tape and adhesive, especially with a pediatric patient, their skin is very sensitive. When you're taking off the tape, you may pull off their skin as well. You may cause a cut or abrasion to their skin. So we want to use as less tape as possible. You want to um, alternate electro electrode and pro placement sites and thoroughly assess underlying skin. You want to do that every eight to 24 hours because if the electrodes just stay on one part of the skin, day in and day out, guess what's going to happen? That skin is going to start to break down. So you want to rotate the sites and make sure you assess the skin um, underneath where those probes were placed. Use a draw sheet. This is a biggie. And Clex asked about this. They expect you to know this. Why? Because when you're moving that patient, that friction can cause them to have um, an ulcer. That friction can cause... Um, their wound, their wound or their skin to open up, it can decrease integrity. So you want to use a draw shift, a draw sheet when you're moving the patient. Position in neutral alignment. Look what it says. Pillows, cushions, or wedges may be needed to prevent hip abduction and pressure to bony prominences. You need to know what those bony prominences are. Look, such as the heels, the elbows, and the sacral and occipital areas. Let's stop right there. So those bony prominences, guys, those are the areas where more pressure is going to be applied. And it makes sense because it's bony. Well, guess what? That increases the patient, that increases their risk of having pressure ulcers. So you want to make sure you keep pressure off those bony prominences. That's why it's important for you to know what those bony prominences are. And it's important that you keep the patient in a neutral position. You don't want them hyperextended or um, flex. You want them in a neutral position. When the child is positioned laterally, pillows or cushions between, look at this, between the knees, under the head, and under the upper arm is going to help promote neutral body alignment. Again, guys, we don't want them flexed or hyperextended. We want them in a neutral position. That's why you're doing this. Look what NCLEX expects you to know. Avoid donut cushions. Those are not good. Why? They can cause tissue ischemia. The cushion um, 
the part of the body that is on that cushion where there's pressure, there's not going to be much circulation. Decreased circulation equals decreased perfusion. Decreased perfusion equals what? Tissue necrosis. The tissue can start to die off if it's being suffocated because it's not getting that oxygen-rich blood that it needs. I know you guys are seeing lots of NCLEX here, but guys, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, when it comes to this portion of PEDS, they ask about this a lot. You need to know. And if you, let's say you're not studying for the NCLEX, you're still in school, you're taking PEDS. Guess what? A lot of the test questions come from this right here. Don't say I didn't warn you. Make sure you know it. Do not massage redden or bony prominences. What are you doing when you're massaging? You're applying pressure. Pressure causes what? Pressure ulcers. So that's why we don't want to do that. Now, again, with maintaining healthy skin, let's go down here. Look at what it says. It says interventions found to prevent skin pressure ulcers in critically ill children include the following. Let's go over it. Assessing the patient's skin from head to toe upon admission and each shift. So we need a baseline. We need a baseline on this patient, what their skin looks like, what the problem areas are so we can complete the care plan, right? And then each shift we're gonna reassess is what we're doing, is it working? And if it's not, we're gonna to have to ch change that plan. You wanna turn the patient every two hours and Clex expects you to know that. Use pillows, blanket rolls, and positioning devices. We want that body in a neutral position and we wanna decrease pressure on sites, especially bony prominences. Use draw sheets to minimize shear. We don't want that friction on the skin. Always use a draw sheet when you're moving the patient. Use pressure reduction surfaces such as foam overlays, gel pads, specialty beds. Allow moisture reduction by using dry weave diapers and disposable underpads. Again, we don't want um, the patient's skin to have urine, to have feces, to have vomitus. We don't want any of those um, fluids on the patient's skin because it promotes breakdown. Use skin moisturizers. Well, I know what you're thinking. Well, Professor D, you just said we don't want the patient's skin wet. Why are we going to use moisturizer? That's a different. The moisturizers keeps the patient's skin from becoming dry, from becoming cracked, and from opening up so that bacteria doesn't come in. There's a difference between moisturizer and urine being on the skin or feces being on the skin. And it can get tricky because if you look back up here, it says, where was I? Using moisture reduction. So guys, you have to when you get a test question, read very closely because we got to talk about what moisture are we talking about? Are we talking about the bad moisture, which is a urine, which is a feces, which is a vomitus, or the good moisture such as, you know, lotions and creams? Um, conducting nutritional consults. Why is nutritional consults important? Well, let me tell you something. Vitamin C, and protein is very important towards wound healing. So it's very important depending on the patient's condition that they have that vitamin C, they have that protein and even um, the calories because calories are needed for um, energy to fight the infection. Uh, medical devices such as pulse oximeter probes, by level and continuous positive airway pressure, mass, oxygen and tracheostomy. I'm going to the next page guys. Be patient with me. Tracheostomy tubes, orthotics, and casts can also cause pressure ulcers. So we have to be very careful. Let's talk about friction. Friction and shear contribute to pressure ulcers. That's why it's so important to use a draw sheet. Friction occurs when the surface of the skin rubs against another surface, such as bed sheets. The skin may have the appearance of an abrasion. It often occurs over, and they're giving you these a bony prominence again, guys, you have to know them, the elbows, the heels, or occiput. So prevention of friction injury includes the use of foam mattresses that redistribute the pressure, customized splinting or foam padded boots over the heel, over the heels, gel pillows, moisturizing agents, protective barriers, and the protective barriers, guys, that goes over susceptible areas and soft, smooth bed linens and clothing. You want to make sure that the bed linens um, are smooth and don't have wrinkles, okay? By itself, friction does not cause tissue necrosis, but when it's acting with gravity, that patient sliding down that bed because you sat them all the way up and now they keep sliding down that bed, 
that is going to result in shear injury. And that is what we want to avoid. Shear is the result of the force of gravity pushing down on the body and friction of the body against a surface such as a bed or a chair. Uh, prevention of shear injury includes using lift sheets or draw sheets when repositioning a patient. Elevating the head no more than 30 degrees, because remember what happens is you sit them up all the way up and then they keep sliding down. We don't want that to happen. So you're going to elevate the head of the bed no more than 30 degrees for short periods and elevating the knees. Why? We want to interrupt the pull of gravity on the body towards the foot of the bed. This was a very short video. But there were so many test questions in that video. So guys, watch this again if you have to. If you have the test coming up, I guarantee you will see a lot of this information. Make sure you, underst uh, you understand it. This was part one of a two-part series. On the next series, I'm going to continue with the hospitalized patient. Please, in the comment section, let me know what you thought about this video. Let me know what uh, content or subjects you'd like to see next. For the next couple of days, though, I will be covering PEDS because... The only book I brought with me on this trip was a peace book. So that's what you guys are going to be learning about. Please don't forget, I now have NCLEX review sessions. And I call them review sessions, but it's really a boost. And the reason I say it's a boost, it's an hour and a half. It's an hour and a half. And if you've been following me for any amount of time, you go, no, I give you the meat and potatoes. I don't believe in wasting time. So I go over the most important things you guys need to know for NCLEX, how to answer these questions when you have no clue what the answer choices are and what you need to be thinking in the back of your mind when you're answering these questions. So for my um, NCLEX boost, for my one-on-one -on -one tutoring, for my audio lessons, all of those can be found on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. And don't forget, guys, almost daily, you can find me covering a variety of nursing topics on my other social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video. You guys will catch me on the next video.